Yeah, it was definitely, it was one of those things, the first time I spoke to John Warhurst, who was supervising sound and music editor on it, and he approached me about coming onto the film. He was like, right, this is a tricky one. We've got three voices and they've got to come out of one actor. I'm not sure if anyone's ever done that before, but it has to feel uh, totally authentic. You can't ever question the fact that that is um, Freddie's voice coming out of Rami's mouth. So it was certainly very tricky and it was lots of fiddly fiddly work to try and get the best of every single element that you have in front of you i mean the some of the difficulties with that for example for the big live aid sequence at the end is that obviously as everybody knows we used freddie's voice um for for the singing there because it's such an iconic performance of course you want to use his voice but we've only got one take of it so it's not you know, obviously when you shoot ADR, you can try different takes if you're trying to make it sync. So I had to make sure that that one take would fit into Rami's mouth. Rami did a fantastic job of kind of recreating every move and the timings and everything of uh, Freddie's original performance. So that really got us a good way of good part of the way there. Um, but I then did use lots of little uh, lip smacks and breaths and elements from Rami's performance when he was performing Live Aid um, for the movie, just to help kind of almost glue Freddie's voice into Rami's mouth. Um, because it's, this, it's all those tiny little details actually that when you're watching it, just trick your eye into feeling like that that is actually coming out of there. So if he's got the mic up here and he kind of blows across the top of it, we're all slightly familiar with that sound, that particular sound you get when you blow on top of a mic. And just to actually add in a little bit of that extra blow on there would really kind of help sell the fact that Freddie's voice was coming out of his mouth. People complain if they can't understand the words. I think they also complain if they don't believe the words. So if you've recorded ADR for an act, you know, for an actor, but it's, it doesn't sound great or it doesn't work, then equally that will bump someone out of watching a watching a feature because you just suddenly the performance doesn't feel genuine anymore, and suddenly you've you've got that disengagement from the story for even if it's just for a moment. I think it can be quite jolting actually when you're sort of really getting absorbed into somebody's performance or or the story that you're watching my job basically is to take care of the sound after it's been shot on set so um my specialism is in dialogue um and adr but dialogue being we call it dialogue because most of what is recorded on set is the performance of the actors it's generally their their words um but obviously all sorts of things are recorded on set as well so there will be other sounds with it and i take care of all the on-set recordings so the supervising sound editor comes on in post-production when there's um a locked ver not a locked version of the film but an edit of the film that's ready to be worked to um, and have some more interesting sound put to it and have the sound that they've already got recorded from set cleaned up or replaced depending on what needs to happen kind of thing. So basically the editors take on the sound that was recorded on set and then go and re-record anything that needs to be recorded in post-production and put all that together ready to be mixed. And that's sort of where we, we carry on through the mix and we're supervising still the editorial work during the mix. But th at that point, a re-recording mixer or a couple of re-recording mixers will come on and actually be mixing the music, the effects and the dialogue, the pre three principal areas all together. The, the thing that I like most about my particular role with that specialism in ADR particularly and dialogue is um, I love the performance aspects of it. I love the fact that we get to go to the recording theatre with the actors and kind of quite often, particularly these days, we record quite a lot of ADR um, for feature films. And it's just, it, it feels like a very creative process. It feels, um, I do love that performance side of it. My mum was an actress, so I, I think, not that I have any desires to be an actor myself, but I find it really interesting, the nuance that you can get from different kinds of performances and the different then impression that gives you when you're watching that performance. So I, I really love that side of it. In terms of sort of cutting dialogues, it's a very f fiddly job. Um, you do lots and lots of tiny little details that hopefully no one would ever even know about, no one will ever notice, but I, I quite like the problem solving side of that. I find that really um, interesting. And I like the sort of uh, the, the sort of fixing it side of that, that kind of thing. 
as a rule no there are a few actors i worked with just a few who who relish it who really love coming in really love the opportunity to um maybe you know have an, another go at something or even tie things together because obviously when they're performing on set it's it can be non-sequential and when they see a scene cut together there might be something else they want to bring to it to sort of tie their performance as in a nice flow through the scene however most of them uh don't don't tend to enjoy it and I can't say I blame them it's a really it's a really difficult thing to do actually to go into an ADR theatre you've usually you know as an actor you've usually finished on the film maybe months ago um, you come and you're on another job so your headspace is somewhere else you're performing a different character usually by then so you come in and you know you have to watch yourself up on screen and you, there's an awful lot to think about you've got to try and get yourself back to the moment that you were on set back into that character um, back into the sort of vocal performance performance that you get because it's so important to try and get a really similar delivery of the lines in terms of breathiness and pitch and all those sorts of things and get it in sync with your lips that you're watching on, on screen so there's an awful lot actually that you've got to take on board while you're doing it um, but I think we'll do everything we do everything we can to try and make uh, it as comfortable for them as possible and as painless as possible and actually just sort of support them in their process to get where they need to go to be able to give a performance that they're happy with in ADR. A huge part of trying to make it as comfortable as possible is, is sort of reading the room. When you're in an ADR studio, if you've got somebody, you know, an actor who is feeling tense about doing it, it's very exposing as well. I mean, you're in a, in a soundproofed room as well, where suddenly your voice sounds very, very present and very loud on set. You've got all sorts of things going on around you. It won't feel the same. And you've also got other actors to perform with. So it's it's kind of, it is a, it is a really tricky thing. And I think if you can, you know, you, you've also got several people in there. So I'll be in there. There'll be, you know, at least one person recording the sound, the ADR mixer. You'll have the director in there. Sometimes you might have the editor, the producer. You might actually have quite an army of people in there with the actor as well. And they've got to stand there and just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And each time you give them notes. And I think that, you know, the best thing to do is ask them how they want to do it work the way they like to work if they want to move around great it always helps anyway if they want to listen to the line and repeat it afterwards that's fine do it that way however they feel most comfortable working and um i think it, it's just a sense of of sort of keeping their keeping the atmosphere in there very positive I worked on Evita as an assistant many, many years ago, um, but obviously I didn't get, uh, although I was observing a lot of the process going on because I was an assistant, I wasn't actually editing anything myself. So I did get to sort of enjoy how musicals get put together because it is quite, there's quite a lot that goes into it to try and make it work as well as it does, you know, watching someone performing on camera, the voice looking like it's perfectly in sync coming out of their mouth. Uh, but also perfectly in time with the music. There's, there's extra elements in there. I find it really interesting. Cats was a very complex project for sound, I have to say, because it was um, they were all recorded on set because they were all um, in, in CGI visual effects. We were fortunate enough that the sound recordist, Simon Hayes, was able to mic them all visibly. Obviously, most of the time on set, people are always trying to hide the microphones, which then isn't necessarily the ideal placement. But on Cats, they were able to wear their mics on their foreheads in vision because that was all going to be in visual effects anyway with fur and stuff. So the mics would be then removed in post-production. Um, but it meant that it was a great placement for recording their voices. And it meant that we could use all the voices from that were recorded on set while they were dancing around with all the appropriate energy and breath um, performance that they gave at the time which is really crucial to making it very believable it was just quite a mammoth task because of the big ensemble pieces so we had you know sort of 24 tracks of, of singing going on at once uh, it's it's quite a lot of tracks to deal with it you know individually it just multiplies the amount of time you have to spend to, to get it all as good as it can be Everything is getting becoming more ambitious. So gravity is a perfect example of that. You know, the actors were in these contraptions where they were being moved around to look like they were in space. And the contraptions themselves made noises. You know, on Everest, they had big wind machines, so they looked like they were up the top of the mountain in the middle of a storm. And that noise then can't be um, removed from their dialogue. So, you know, on all those occasions, I think with ambitious things happening on set, it can all, often affect the sound. And everybody knows you can go in ADR at all afterwards so you do have an option to 
uh, visually record it how you want it, but then obviously uh, re-perform the sound later and add it on. But I think also um, a lot of a lot of work happens in post production now, where people are thinking about the story, and you know how you have lots of people on the film, lots of different creative ideas. And sometimes when you cut the film together, you might decide, you know what. I think we maybe don't need this scene, but then you need to record some extra di lines of dialogue just to be able to sort of bridge across bits of story um, and those kinds of things. I mean, the other thing is like, action films always need a lot of ADR because everyone needs to be doing breaths and efforts all the way through it. They're usually like leaping around, saving people. So you need to be able to hear them. It definitely feels really creative and, and there's so so much sort of so many hybrids these days as well. I've worked on Mowgli and on Detective Pikachu, uh, which were like head, head mounted camera kind of ADR shoots, which are a, a sort of blend between being on set, but being ADR because you've got sort of the picture that has been cut together to a certain degree. Uh, so you need to be able to reference the edit that you have, but you also need to film and record sound for the performance that they're doing there. So that makes it like more like being on set there's lights there's cameras um and we're recording the sound as well and they need to be able to move around so those kind of um blended ideas are really really interesting as well and feel very creative i love getting involved with with all that side of it it's always really nice to learn new things actually but i think uh, people maybe do do not quite understand with sound editorial that so much stuff is added in post-production. You know, it's like the principal job on the set is to capture the performances of the actors. Um, so any of the extras that are in the background will be miming. We need to replace all that by recording it in post-production with um, loop groups or crowds. Um, you know, so much of the sound design obviously is added afterwards and sound effects. That's all recorded afterwards or, or used from libraries. But we usually try and go out and record stuff bespoke obviously the music is all recorded afterwards so so much stuff ha actually happens in post-production that goes into the soundtrack whereas I think the, you know but we're all working towards the end result where someone watches the film and it feels like what they're what they're listening to happened on the day that it was performed and, and you know when it was filmed so there's some big technological aspects to it but i mean generally we're, we're driven by the creativity everything that we use the technology for is because we're driving towards um a creative end if you like i feel like we spend a lot of time almost reverse engineering our kind of um what we want to do so we'll we'll kind of for example on live aid we're like well, we need lots of people clapping how are we going to get that and then so you kind of instead of going well we can't do that we had, we've managed to speak to the band and they were performing at the O2 and got Brian May to ask the audience to clap for us while we recorded it, you know, and it's that it's those kind of things. You just I think you you the technology almost evolves because of the creativity. And so they are totally intertwined and you couldn't be creative without the technology. Uh, but I think the creative the creative side of it is always the driver. The reason technology expands into all sorts of different things, like with all the remote, the new remote technology that's come out since COVID, that's again driven by the fact that we need to collaborate, you know, from all our individual little places, you know, and and so it is it's always driven by the fact that we need to be creative and we need to collaborate together and we need to problem solve how we can best do this so the technology then scoops up behind and kind of uh, gives us up, gives us ways of doing it i think you need to uh listen well i think it's mostly about listening to be honest i think if you can train yourself to hear subtle differences in the things that you're listening to particularly with dialogue and adr there's an awful lot of nuance that i feel i can pick up on now um after years and years and years of doing it i'm not sure that you'd have it when you start out potentially i think also because the sound team tends to be quite big you know you have generally one picture editor on a film but sound you know you have an entire team of course you have your heads of department but it is a big team collaborative effort um so it's really helpful to have people who you know can kind of uh work fast when they need to work fast but work detailed when they need to work detailed and really everyone pull in the same direction don't get too precious about the work that you've done because it 
all of it is movable and actually until you get into the mix and hear everything together you know it's very hard to judge how a scene should ultimately play you might suddenly decide you don't want to hear any sound effects you just want to play it on the music you know or vice versa so i think it's it's important to just be kind of be very open be creative um and really use your ears and listen well and have that emotional intelligence to be to be a really helpful and valuable member of a team the picture editor obviously is you know is the the first person who's receiving the material who's listening to the sound and, and is the person who's starting to assemble the film and they're doing that uh, you know in in with the director so during the shoot they're starting to assemble it and then they sit down with the director usually they have time for the director's cut so they are basically just looking at it the entire time and trying to sketch out exactly how they want scenes to play and within the avid they will be laying in music laying in key sound effects obviously uh, cutting the dialogue how they'd like it to be if they want to add lines they might even record kind of lines in the cutting room with them one of them saying it just to sort of map out out and sketch us a template of how they uh, imagine the shape the soundtrack will take against the picture that they've edited so it's really key for us actually to have a good communication with the editor and make sure that when we take on that role of then taking over the sound and taking it up to the next level in terms of quality and creativity um, we're we're st we're meeting the vision that they and the director have sort of arrived at it's just it's a really uh, crucial collaboration it feels I, obviously as well when we working they are still cutting the film usually so we it's really useful to have a close relationship with them and see which direction they might be going they might have had a screening and get some feedback and and be you know structurally changing things which is really useful for us to know ahead of time because we're always booking recordings in and those kinds of things so we need to sort of know which direction the the film is going in to be able to sort, sort of uh, you know support it from our end as best as possible John and I have known each other since I think it was early 2000s I think the first time we worked together we were trying to piece it together but I think we'd known each other maybe on different films down the corridor kind of thing but then we worked together on the hours uh, which was quite a hard grueling job I mean it was called the hours and we did the hours on it we did very very long days while we were working on that um and and we got to know each other then and then we'd sort of our paths would cross on and off through the industry you know throughout uh times when especially when he was music editing then we'd be in the mix together on various different films like bridget jo bridget jones's diary things like that um and i think we've always both come at everything from exactly the same standpoint in terms of you know we both f feel very passionately that the everything has to the dialogue has to be in sync everything has to be in perfect sync um everything has to feel real we love the detail of it all you know so while i'm putting lip smacks into the vocal he's recording like piano thunks which like piano foley so that you actually hear the sounds of the keys going down not just the the actual music that's coming out of the piano so you get a sense of that you know again you can almost barely hear it you just feel it but it really helps sort of glue it all into reality um so i think we come from a very similar creative standpoint um and we have we just communicate really well you know having known each other for so long as well we you know we're good friends uh, in work and out of work i work with john and i work with ilam hoffman is the other person i co-supervise with Sim similar thing you know we have very um very similar standpoints in terms of uh, how we come at the come at the job and want to do everything bespoke and want to go out and record it rather than pull things from a library and those kinds of things I really like co-supervising because I mean I've off, I've been asked to do things on my own and I was kind of go well can I do it? I'd, I'd really like to do it with someone because there are so many elements to it so when I supervise with John you know I've really got my head on the whole dialogue ADR crowd all of that side of it he you know quite often we work on musicals because of his background with music so we you know he'll be really be overseeing the music and we'll both be overseeing the effects when I work with Alam he's a sound designer so he's really got his you know eye all over the design and I'm working on the um, dialogue side of things and I think you just get a much kind of broader perspective of it all and you complement each other oh it was an incredible experience I loved working on that film I mean Robert Altman was fantastic I mean obviously so iconic I was very excited to be working with him and and it definitely felt like 
you know, he was bringing something different as well. This was one of the first films where the sound recordist recorded 16 tracks. And again, at the time, it's not wasn't a hard disc recorder. It was on these Tascam tapes. So you had to loop two of these tapes together that each took eight tracks on them. Because, you know, it was important to Robert Altman that his actors could um, just ad lib their way through scenes and have all these conversations. But then, of course, when it all comes together in the finished um, finished film, I, I remember this one sequence where they're all kind of sitting round in a sitting room and they're all having these individual conversations. And when it's all cut together because it's ad lib, they're not they're not saying the same things when you cut back to them. It's not a cohesive conversation. But in the finished film, we need to feel like, you know, every time the camera drifts past them, we hear a little bit of their conversation. When we come back to them, it still needs to make sense. <laughs> So it was really, really tricky. I remember spending a really long time to try get, getting everybody's mics, listening to every single take that they'd done and sort of constructing these conversations that worked for each pair of people that were talking, um, but also was in sync when you saw them, but then carried on and made sense as you drifted away from them in case you could still hear them a bit. It was a really complex technical job in terms of dialogue editing and just, you know, fantastic to be working with someone like Robert Altman. And he was so laid back and so wonderful with his crew, um, really collaborative, always asked us all what we thought, um, but very, you know, really decisive about his opinions of things as well. He was, uh, he was a really, really good director. I loved working with him. It's ideal to be, at, we're not in the same room, but it's ideal to maybe be in the same corridor as them where you can just pop in and out and, and ask questions. You know, it, there's a lot of flow and a lot of creativity that happens with all our work. And, you know, it's not, it's not, it, it's great to be able to kind of, you're getting through something and you go to something you want to answer straight away because it helps you move on and, and take the next step with something. It's much easier if you can just quickly pop and start, have those conversations and, and keep moving forwards. But of course, we've all done it where we're in different places, even before COVID, you know, we, we might be in different studios depending on where people need to be. Um, so as with everything, we find workarounds. And I think my key is just to keep the lines of communication open, you know, whether it whether it's written communication or verbal kind of catching up communication or sharing media and screens and stuff, just to be able to, to make sure that uh, as much of that sort of collaborative workflow can keep happening. We've done remote ADR for years, you know, previously with ISDN, now more likely with Source Connect, um, actors in another country. But generally you have a studio somewhere where you can get, you know, um, director maybe and, and the ADR supervisor, whoever in one area and then talent elsewhere or whichever way you kind of do it. So it does help to sort of have at least some people in the same room. It gets quite difficult to read the room and sort of feel the progress and judge the sync adequately and all those sorts of things that you take for granted of just being in the room when you're recording ADR. It's it's not ideal and I think it's, I'm sure the world will change massively and people won't fly around necessarily for meetings, but I think ADR is going to be one of those things where it's, you, there's, there's still, you're still better off actually trying to get everybody together and, and just trying to do it and work you know, it's an important thing, ADR, you're re-recording -re someone's performance. It's really important for the film. So I think it's it's worth everybody trying to get together and get, the, get it as good as you absolutely can, you know. I think you have to sort of accept that you're not going to get the same experience as everybody all being in the same room. So maybe it's more about allowing time for people to digest and then kind of watch and then have conversations because you can't, you can't create the same workflow, the same creative kind of vibe and buzz that you get of all being in the same room together and trying something quickly and then nudging it a tiny bit and all those. You can't do that when you're all in different places and all potentially listening to it in different ways. I think, you know, it's more important to, to just sort of, you know, make sure that everyone can listen to it in a reliable format and then have the discussions after.